imagine a light ray incident perpendicularly to some transparent material, say water. Inside it's going to travel more slowly, so these crests of the light wave are spaced more closely. Now imagine it comes in not straight, but it comes in at an angle. Right? If it comes in at an angle, one side is going to hit the water before the other side. So now imagine an axle that is traveling on a hard surface and then reaches the boundary between that hard surface and sand, and one wheel hits the sand before the other wheel hits the sand. What will happen? It will rotate, exactly. It will rotate, it will bend. And the same thing happens with water. If you take a ray of light, and you shine it into water, the angle will change. Now suppose I make the angle larger than it is right now. Here we have a certain angle. I make the angle bigger. What will happen to the amount of bending that occurs? It will become more pronounced, right? Because this one side hits the slower medium, the sand, more early than the other side. So the bigger the angle, the more pronounced the bending is. This a little bit, this more strongly, and so forth. That is true when you go from air to water. But what if you go from the water to the air, the other way around? So suppose that we took that light beam and we inverted it. Instead of going from the air to the water, we go from the water to the air, but we use exactly the same angle. So let's look at this diagram. So if it goes straight, it comes straight out. Little angle, a little bit of bending, bigger angle, more bending. And you can already see that something funny is going to happen. But if I make this angle a little bit bigger, I reach what is called a critical angle, where the ray is going to travel right along the surface. And of course, there's one more ray, which I'm not showing here. There's a reflected ray, because there's also going to be a little bit of reflection of the surface. So as, as you have this ray, there's a reflected ray, and there's a bent ray called a refracted ray. And here, the refracted ray is parallel. So what is going to happen if I make the angle larger than this? All of the light will be reflected. It will be like an absolutely perfect mirror. If you look in the mirror in the morning, you wake up and wash your face, you look in the mirror, that is a pretty good mirror. We, that's why we use it as mirrors. It's a silver surface, but the reflection is not perfect. About 1% or a fraction of a percent of the light gets lost at the interface in the metal that is coated onto the glass and the glass itself. This mirror, however, is absolutely perfect. It reflects 100% exactly to an infinite accuracy of the light. It's called a phenomenon called a total internal reflection. OK, so let's imagine putting our head below the water, as that circle indicates. And what you'll see is that within a certain cone angle, the light rays will go outside of the water. And conversely, the light from outside the water will go inside the water within that given cone angle. But outside that cone angle, everything is going to be completely reflected. So that means that to the left and to the right of that critical angle, the water looks like a mirror. So thinking about that for a moment, suppose you're lying on your back on the bottom of a swimming pool and the water is completely still. What would the surface of that pool look like? So you lie on your back and you look straight up. What do you see? A what? A mirror. A mirror, yes, but the, only a mirror on the left and the right in this diagram. In the center, you should be able to see out. What will be the shape of that area through which you can see the outside world? You'd see a circle. Now, very few of us have seen that because it's really hard to lie on the back on the bottom of a pool and wait long enough for the surface to be completely still. But I have some pictures to actually show to you that circle. Here's a, a girl holding a fish. And you can see the edge of that circle. And notice how you see the trees at the edge of the water, right? Those are the rays that, that come at the edge of that mirror and go straight to the edge. And here's a picture in the sea, in the ocean, looking up. And you can actually see that circle. So outside the circle, it's a mirror. But because the sea is deep, it's dark. So you, you can't actually see the bottom. Here's another picture that shows the edge of a pool. And notice that even though you only see within a limited circle, you can see the entire world around. The, the edge of the pool, the tiles at the edge of the pool are actually visible right there. You can see them.
So you can see the entire world around. It's not that this mirror prevents you from seeing something outside. Anyway, that's just a curiosity. Let's get back to the mirror because that's what matters for propagating the light. Now we have a mirror just by having some material, water or plastic or glass. And that's actually used whenever you make a phone call to guide the light from wherever you are to wherever your phone call goes. If you take a slab of plastic or glass and you put light in and you put it in in such a way that there's total internal reflection, then this light ray can't escape. It bounces without any loss from here until California. Absolutely amazing. If you were to lose just a fraction of a percent, that would be terrible because many bounces, many bounces, fraction of a percent, you lose everything after a certain distance. You, you should not lose anything in many, many, many miles of plastic material. And because it's totally, it's a total, it's a perfect reflection, you can actually do this. First application was in 1890 in the World Exhibit, which was organized in Paris. Here's a fountain, and the person who first thought about guiding light didn't think about telephone conversations and so on. He thought about, you know, what, can, what neat tricks can we do with it? And one is to shine the light inside a water jet and illuminate it from the inside out. And you may have seen a, a, a lamp like this, which is based on the same principle. There's a light in the bottom and it illuminates these fibers. And because the light can only escape at the tip, at the end, you see all the light, all this beautiful, and then there's a little things that change the color to make it more pretty. This is the same thing and much bigger. I can shine the light in here, and you can see that it's forced to stay inside until it comes out here. And if you actually were to look very closely, you could see the laser beam bounce back and forth inside. So that's what happens whenever you place a telephone conversation. Now, the fibers that we use in, uh, in telecommunications are much thinner than these ones. These are rather thick. The ones that are used in telecommunication are about the thickness of a hair, or about 100 micron. And uh, 100 micron is very small, like a hair, but it's still too small for things that you want to make very compact. For example, you can't take a fiber like this and bend it very tightly. If you were to bend this very tightly, then there where you bend it very tightly, the light would no longer be totally internally reflected and it would escape, right? Because now all of a sudden the light hits it at an angle that's, that's too steep and it goes out. So you cannot bend light very tightly and you can't make really micro-scale devices with light. So we've been looking in the past uh, five years or so at ways to actually bend the light so tightly that you can start thinking about building optical chips about using light instead of electronics to do computing, processing, and so on. Why would that be good? Well, light travels very fast, a lot faster than electrical signals, and light can be processed much faster than electrical signals. So if you could go from electronics to optics, you could increase the speed by about a factor of a million. So instead of a gigahertz uh, uh, chip, you could make a terahertz or even a faster chip than that. So you could increase the speed tremendously.